Well, today we're going to continue on in our series that we started a couple weeks ago on the life of Jesus, and we're looking at we're looking at Jesus, and we're looking at some of his interactions and some of his experiences. And today we're going to talk about the temptation of Christ and how he went into the desert and uh, before he started his public ministry, and he was tempted by the devil. Now, before we get into that, um, probably we should start thinking for ourselves a little bit about temptations. You know, what are some of the things? that tempt you? What are some of the ways you are tempted? Now, maybe some of those temptations are innocent enough, like uh, some of you women might really be tempted by chocolate. Uh, I don't mean to uh, stereotype or anything like that, but you know, a lot of women love chocolate. Some of you men, maybe you're just tempted by a good steak or whatever, and you're like, come on, really? Is that what we're talking about today, church? Is that really that big of a deal? You know, but there are other temptations, you know, temptations maybe for relationships, maybe some students out there, young people, you're tempted to enter into relationships that you know aren't right, that aren't good for you. So there's, there are relational temptations. And, you know, there's, the temptations get, you know, increasingly more serious. Maybe a temptation um, toward a sexual sin or pornography. I, I know that's a pretty big deal today because of how much uh, stuff is out there on the internet in movies, it's so easy to get tempted by sexual stuff. I remember uh, taking a trip, a family trip to Las Vegas, and we couldn't even walk down the street. It was it, my son was young. I don't know what we were thinking going there with a with a family with young people. We had heard it had cleaned up. It hasn't cleaned up. Okay, so we're walking down the street, and I'm, I remember you know there's there's billboards, so it's. I would say, AJ, don't look up at the billboards. And so he couldn't look up. And then he would look down. And the, there were those tracts, you know, the flyers, that the por- pornographic flyers that people were giving out on the streets that were litter- littering the ground. And, and so I said, no, you can't look down. Don't look down. So, so now he's like, he looks over to the street. Well, there's, you know, there's driving billboards with pornography on the billboards. Like, don't look over there either. So the poor kid, you know, he, he just kind of had to close his eyes. He couldn't really look anywhere. I had to hold his hand and walk him through the streets of Las Vegas. How stupid were we to go there with him? But that's kind of what the world is. The world is filled with temptations. They're all around us, all of these different temptations. Maybe your temptation is, is a temptation uh, toward an addiction, you know, a drug or alcohol addiction or something like that. But w- So whether your temptation is small or huge, you know, no big deal or a huge deal, I think there's some stuff for us to learn from how Jesus dealt with temptations when he uh, was confronted with them in the Bible. So grab your Bibles. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 4, and let's talk about the temptation of Jesus. All right, let's set this up a little bit before we get started. So Jesus was born, you know, he had uh, the, the whole Christmas thing, the nativity. He he grew up, uh, you know, by, by many accounts, probably a fairly normal kid, except that he was sinless. He hadn't started his ministry yet. It wasn't until he was about 30 years old that he started his public ministry. He went out and he was going to do miracles. We'll look more at at this in the weeks to come. And then he ends up going to the cross, dying on the cross and being raised from the dead, all that kind of stuff. So before he does any of that, um, he goes out into the desert after his baptism. He goes out into the desert and it's in the desert. He's there for 40 days and he's fasting and it's out there that he gets tempted by the devil. Satan comes and tempts him. And so there are three temptations that we see, and, and I'm going to interpret these temptations just a little bit for us as we get into it so we can begin to understand it. And then at the end of this, at, at the very end, I want to make sure to give some real practical tips. So we're going to gather some practical tips after we've read this and, and taken a look at these three temptations. So let's take a look at the first temptation. This first one I call the physical temptation, and it's the temptation to do what feels right. Here's what it says in Matthew 4, verse 3 and 4. During that time, the devil came and said to Jesus, so he's out there in the wilderness, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. All right, now this was a physical temptation. So you can imagine why uh, Satan is going to try to tempt him physically. 
Jesus had just fasted for 40 days, and the Bible makes one of the greatest understatements of all time. It says, and Jesus was hungry. So I, I'm sure you would be really hungry too if you'd fasted for 40 days. I don't know if you've ever tried to fast before. On a side note, we've got some resources in our library on fasting. But fasting is one of those things. That at different times in my life, I've done a fast here and there. And sometimes if I fasted for more than a day, your mind starts playing tricks on you if you know anything about that. You know, you fast maybe for a particular purpose or a spiritual reason or whatever, but after a day or two, your mind, even before that, probably after a couple of hours, you know, your mind starts playing tricks on you. Um, and, and it's easy for you to say, oh, you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal. You know, you've made this commitment to fast, but then you break it and, and you feel guilty and all that kind of stuff. We've probably all been there if we've ever tried to fast before, but Jesus had made it 40 days and he was hungry. And so, Satan came to Jesus and said, here, you know, the kind of the simplest thing to do is to tempt someone physically and say, here, come on, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Just do what feels right. You're hungry, right? So just do what feels right. You know, go ahead and eat. Now, again, it's not that, real, it's not that big of a deal if Jesus would have eaten. It's not like it was a, was a sin for him to eat something. It's not a sin for you to eat. It's not really even a sin if you try to fast and you, and you fail at your fast. It's okay. It's not, that, it's not that big of a deal. But the point here is Satan is trying to tempt Jesus with this physical temptation. And he's trying to appeal to something in all of us, in, in human nature that we all have, that says, I want to do what, it, what my flesh wants. You know, that's, that's the biblical word for it, your flesh, as opposed to your, you know, the, more, the spiritual side of you. It's the fleshly side of you. It's like so, some verses call it the old person. Like, I want, the, I, want to, I want to appeal to the old person. I want to appeal to my old nature. You know, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've put your faith in Christ, you have a new nature. Now, if you haven't yet done that, you can do that even today, and I encourage you to do that. But for those who have put their faith in Christ, the Bible says they have a new nature. The Spirit of God is in them. The Spirit lives in you and is moving you to do the things that honor God. So you have this new nature, but you have the old habits, right? You still have those old temptations. And so this is how I like to think about this temptation. Uh, Jesus is being tempted to eat. He's, he's, he's saying, here, eat this. It's no big deal. Satan is saying, eat this. It's no big deal. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to fall for that. I'm not going to just obey my base desires. I'm not going to obey these things. Now, I don't know in your life as, as we're, you know, whenever we hear anything from the life of Christ or from the Bible, we always try to apply it to our own lives. I don't know what that brings up in your mind. You know, are there some physical temptations in your world right now? You know, some, te some temptations where you're being drawn to that thing. You know, maybe, maybe it is something related to food. Maybe, maybe you're gluttonous. You know, we never preach against gluttony anymore, but it's actually wrong for you to just, just gorge yourself and, and just you know, sort of be self-satisfying because that's the issue of physical temptation is it's just self-satisfaction. It is just, I don't care about anything else. It's just all about me. That's what pornography is. It is just, it is selfishness. You're feeding your flesh and you don't care if it ruins your marriage. You don't care if you're you know, if you're sort of objectifying a woman, you don't care if, if you're not married yet. Young people, you might be like, come on, it's no big deal. I mean, on TV, people make light of pornography, pornography but it is a big deal. You know, you're, you're ruining the whole idea of what God has intended for one man and one woman. And so, but you're, you're falling for that basic temptation to satisfy your flesh, Everyone has that. Everyone has that temptation to just do what feels right in the moment. And yet God would say to that, we're not dogs. We're not animals. We don't just do whatever our flesh says. We can have self-control and we can resist temptation. That's what Jesus did. Here's the second temptation. It's what I call the emotional temptation. And in this case, it's the temptation to question God's love. Here's what the Bible says. The devil took Jesus next to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you're the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, God will order his angels to protect you. 
and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And Jesus responded like this. He said, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Now, there's a lot of great stuff in this section here because, first of all, did you notice what Satan does? Satan uses scripture. He manipulates scripture to try to trick Jesus. So he says, well, the Bible says this, and Jesus doesn't fall for it. Jesus, Jesus says, well, the Bible also says this other thing. See, it's really important for us, by the way, if we're, if we're trying to be pursuers of God, it's important for us to be on our toes when it comes to people who would even use the Bible, God's words, God's very words against him. And this is exactly what Satan was doing. But there's something else here that might be confusing for some people because, you know, he's talking about jumping off of a building and, and Jesus says, no, you shouldn't test God. I'm not going to test God. Well, the natural question is, well, test what? What exactly was Satan trying to get Jesus to test? And here's what it is, and this is why I call this the emotional temptation. He's, he's trying to get Jesus to say, listen, did God really say that he loves you? Are you sure that God loves you? It's kind of like what Satan said to Eve at the very beginning in Genesis. Did God really say you can't eat from these, you know? Satan is a manipulator. He's twisting these words. And what he's doing here, and he's trying to do this to Jesus, and he does this to us even today because he's not creative. So he has no new tricks. So let's pay attention to these tricks and let's learn from them. What he's doing is he's trying to get you emotionally to buy into one of his lies. And so Jesus said, in essence, he said, no, I'm not going to test God. So basically the argument, Satan's argument was this, jump off and if God really loves you, then he will protect you and you won't get hurt. And Jesus said, I don't need to do that. I don't need to test God's love. Why? Because God has already said it. Now, again, this is a little confusing because Jesus is God. So think of it like this. God the Father, think about the baptism of Jesus. We looked at this already. At Jesus' baptism, God the Father told everybody there, I love, this is my son, I love him, I'm pleased by him. So Jesus already knew what God the Father had said. So he doesn't have to test it anymore. So he's not, he's not going to fall for that sort of emotional trick where Satan is trying to get <coughs> Jesus, uh, he's preying on his emotions and he's trying to get Jesus to second guess, you know, whether God really loves him. Now, just real quick, apply this to your own life. You know, we're surrounded by lies and deception from the enemy, and it, it, it doesn't come in the form of, of a, you know, a devil in a red suit with horns. It comes in the form of friends, you know, quote unquote friends. It comes in the form of TV and movies and whatever. So, but there are lies all around us. And, and we, we can easily fall prey to this sort of emotional, emotional response that says, well, because, this, because of this thing in my life, God must not love me. Because you've listened to some half-truth or some lie. So, for example, here's a lie. A lot of people believe that if you're sick, then that means God doesn't love you. Well, that's ridiculous. You know, the Bible says God loves you. So if you look at an illness in your family as, as God punishing you, then that's, that's not always the right way to look at that situation because God's word already said something else. So you can't let your circumstances, whatever they are, you can't let your circumstances sort of overrule what God has already said. If you do that, you're going to be an emotional wreck. And I know a lot of people who are just wrecks emotionally because they don't they don't trust God's word. They don't take God at his word, which is what Jesus was doing. Is Jesus was saying, I'm not going to test God. He's already said it. God the Father has already said it. And so I believe it. I don't have to test it. I don't know if maybe there's some other areas in your own life where maybe, maybe doubting your faith or some things in your life, in your own pursuit of God, in your own relationship with God, you, you think a certain way and you've allowed the, maybe the enemy to sort of sneak in and to trick you and emotionally you're a wreck because you're not just standing on what God's word has said in spite of your circumstances, in spite of what's happening 
in your life. Jesus overcame that second temptation. And then there's one more, the third temptation, and here it is. And it's the temptation to take over the throne of your own life. Look at what it says in verse 8. Next, the devil took Jesus to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. And look at how Jesus responded. He said, get out of here, Satan. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Now, this might be the most confusing of all the temptations because if you look at that passage, you see some issues happening. First of all, why does Satan get to give Jesus uh, the world? I mean, this always confused me when I read this. And and he's saying, here, I'm going to give the world to you. Well, Jesus created the world. (coughs) What does that mean that he's, that Satan, does Satan have the authority to give that to Jesus? Well, he doesn't really, but Jesus himself in John 14 said that, that Satan is the ruler of this world. Now, that doesn't mean that Satan has complete sovereignty over the world because God is still God and God is on, on his throne. But it does mean this, that, that the world is, is sort of influenced by Satan and his lies and his deception. And so there are several places in the Bible, and we've got resources in our library that explain this, but there are several places in the Bible that explain that, G, that Satan is the ruler of this world. He's the prince of, of this world, and, and so he has influence in our world. Again, if, if you have any doubt about that, just spend a weekend in Las Vegas and you'll see what I'm talking about. But it's not just there. It's all over the place. Satan is involved because he's a tempter and he's always trying to influence people. God is still in control, but Satan has power right now. He's got, he's got some, some sway in the world right now. But what's really happening here is this. He's, he brings Jesus and he says, listen, I'm going to give you all the world, all the kingdoms. And you have to understand it from Jesus' perspective. This is what he came for. Jesus came to set up the kingdom of God. Jesus came to usher in the kingdom of God. And this is why it was a temptation for him. Because this is what Jesus came for. But see, Jesus knew that the pathway to establishing the kingdom of God on earth, the pathway to that was through the cross. Jesus knew that he had to go to the cross, that he had to, he had to go through his ministry and go to the cross and die that excruciating death. And it was only this way that he could establish the kingdom on earth. And so what Satan in essence is offering him is he's saying, here's a shortcut to what God wants for you anyway. You see how Satan is so manipulative. He's such a liar. And Jesus didn't fall for it. Even though there was probably a part of Jesus that, 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 where that would have probably felt uh, appealing, Jesus said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to worship you, Satan. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to bow down to you for the sake of accomplishing my mission. Because in essence, what it would be doing is it would be putting, it would be putting Jesus, sort of elevating him over the, the will of the Father, And the will of the Father was to do it this way. And Jesus said, I'm going to do it that way. Now, in our own lives, this is really applicable because in our own lives, it's so easy for us to to fall prey to this control temptation. You know, this temptation that says, okay, I want to put myself on the throne of my life. I, you know, I know what God has said. I know what God wants. I, I know that I'm supposed to, as a Christian, I'm, I'm supposed to live to honor God. Or even for those of you who aren't yet followers of Jesus, one of the roadblocks is because you want to be on the throne of your own life. You know, nobody wants to, to give up control to God, but yet this is exactly what Jesus was saying, worship God and him alone. And, th- and this is that third temptation that control temptation. Now here's what I want to do to close, to close off this, this message today because I think it's really important for us to take some time to bring this home. And we don't have time to do that in a sermon. We never do. That's why we always encourage you to take this stuff home with you. Use those resources with your family, your small group, or a mentor and really talk about this and pray about this and process this in your life. Because when we're talking about temptation, this is not something that, that uh, we can just deal with in 30 minutes. This is something that we have to allow God to work at in our hearts 
through the course of the week and the month and, and even our lives. But I want to just end with these five things, five lessons about temptation for today. And we learn these from this passage right here. And here's the first one. No one is exempt from temptation. I mean, I think if, if you learn anything, it's, it's this. Even Jesus was subjected to temptation. And, and Jesus went through temptations, and so will you, and so will your kids, and so did your parents and their parents. Every single human being is going to experience temptation. It's just the way it works. No one is exempt from temptation, so be on your guard, be ready, because it's going to come into your life. Here's the second thing we learn. Temptation is not the same as sin. This is a question we get a lot. You know, people say, well, wait, is it a sin for me to be tempted? I was mentoring someone just a few weeks ago and he asked this very question. Is it a sin when I'm tempted? And it's not a sin for you to be tempted. If it, if it were a sin, then Jesus would have sinned. And we know that Jesus didn't sin. He was tempted, yet without sin. So you can be tempted and not sin. See, it becomes a sin when you do something with that temptation. Do you notice that Jesus never entertained these temptations? He put those temptations down right away. And that's the same in our lives. When we entertain a temptation, now we're starting to walk in toward sin. But when we learn right away to acknowledge, to recognize temptation and to, and to put it away <laughs> immediately, then we can have victory over temptation. Here's a third thing we learn, that we should respond to temptation with God's word. Did you notice that that's what Jesus did every single time? Go back and look at that. Every time Satan tried to manipulate Jesus and tempt Jesus with a lie, Jesus responded with the truth. This is what you have to understand about temptation. Temptation is always lie-based. And so a lie is coming at you in the form of a temptation. And so you have to combat that temptation with the truth. And God's word is truth. So every single time, Jesus threw the truth right back in Satan's face and he was able to defeat that temptation. If you have a regular temptation in your life, maybe a pornography temptation, a drug addiction, uh, a, temp a relational temp a chocolate temptation, whatever that thing is, whether big or small, if you have a temptation in your life, listen, find portions of God's word that speak to that temptation. They're in there. You can find them and memorize those scriptures because Jesus knew scripture. Jesus didn't pull out his phone and, and pull out his Bible app and quote that. Jesus knew the scripture. You should know the scripture too. A lot of people that I've mentored that have really had victory over temptation or addiction in their life, and a lot of it was just simply because they started to learn God's word, the truth of God. That's how you can fight temptation. Here's the fourth thing. Resist the devil in the power of of the Spirit. Okay, now follow me here. This is really important. You know, the Bible says that Jesus was led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, into the wilderness, and it says the Holy Spirit empowered him while he was there, especially during his time of temptation. Did you realize that that same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is in you if you're a follower of Jesus? The Bible says, Ephesians 1 13, that if you've put your faith in Christ, then the Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence in you to move you to be obedient to God. And so that means this, Jesus didn't have some special edge or special advantage over me and you when he was in the wilderness. You might say, oh, well, Jesus, Jesus was able to uh, endure temptation because he's God. Now, he is God, but he didn't, <coughs> he didn't use any special superpowers to defeat this temptation. He defeated it with God's word and with the Holy Spirit. And you have the same word of God available to you, and you have the same spirit of God in you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. So that is how you can resist. You can't resist temptation. You can't overcome addiction or, or pornography or anything like that. You can't do that on your own power or by the strength of your own will. You do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that helped Jesus that day in the wilderness. And here's the last and final thing, and here it is. Pursue the will of God. I don't know if you noticed, but every single time Jesus was tempted, and by the end of the story, he is making it so clear that he's pursuing the will of God in his life. Now, I think one of the easiest ways to overcome temptation is to be seeking God. Because when you're seeking God, it keeps you off the streets, you know? It keeps you, it keeps you 
proactively doing something positive, you're pursuing God, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you're pursuing God. And so it helps you to not be so worried or enamored with with pursuing these other things and falling for these other temptations. So actively pursue God, actively pursue the will of God in your life. This is just what Jesus did. I wanna close with just with one thing. Hopefully you'll take some of these things and bring them to your home, bring them to a mentor, accountability partner, or your small group and really talk about it. But I wanna close by just addressing the person who's here who hasn't yet put their faith in Christ. Listen, I want you to know this, this is really simple. The will of God for you is that you put your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross for your sins. The Bible says that you have no hope to have victory over temptation in your life apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ. You know, if you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus, I just really encourage you, before you leave today, talk to someone about doing just that. Talk to someone about putting your faith in Christ because that will trigger all of this victory that you can have in your life. Victory over temptation, just like Jesus had. Let's pray together. God, I pray that you would help us to understand your word. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give every single person the ability to have victory over temptation in their life. Thank you for the example of Jesus. But even more than that, Lord God, we know that Jesus wasn't just an example. We know that he, God, that he empowers us and makes us able to have victory over temptation in our lives. And I pray that that would be true for every single person, for your sake and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen.